Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. This is the history of solid state drives on our channel from 2016 to 2023, part two. This was not planned to be a two part video series. However, it ended up turning out that way. I filmed part one in December of 2022 and then Christmas and holidays got in the way. And I actually have a fairly decent length of time between filming part one and part two. So if you have not watched the first part of this series, that is linked down in the video description below. You really should watch that one first. This won't make a lot of sense otherwise. I am not going to explain terms and a lot of the basics here. That was explained in part one. Here, we're going to get to the rest of the stack. And yes, for those of you who missed part one, this is the rest of the stack. So for those of you who are watching and did watch all of part one, thank you very much. Without further ado, definitely grab a drink, grab a snack, because we're going to be here for a while, and let's get into it. Buy Windows 10 Professional for $15, activate instantly online with Microsoft, and keep it forever. Don't pay full price. Get the best deal from our sponsor, URCD Keys, using our link in the video description below. Full details on how this amazing deal works at the end of the video. A few years ago, ADATA sent us lots of drives for review. I actually have not received anything from them in a while, although in fairness, I haven't asked. Solid state drives have taken an interesting turn over the past few years. This is an SU650 Ultimate. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? It's not. This is about as entry level as entry level gets. This appears to be a TLC drive and not a QLC drive. It dates from 2019, and it was sort of their budget level SATA drives that came out around that era. They had the SU630, SU650, SU750, SU800, and SU900. Now, we'll get to some of those others in just a minute, but specifically, the SU650 was a DRAMless, yuck, SATA SSD with shall we say, very average performance, and that is being generous. Now, the price was reasonable at the time when these launched, they were relatively inexpensive drives. And if your alternative was a hard drive, well, then it's awesome, great, and amazing, and two thumbs up, two gold stars, and two scoops of ice cream. But you certainly wouldn't want to use this today for anything other than a very tertiary storage. Drives like this were an excellent stepping stone into SSDs a couple of years ago. I wouldn't even use this as a game drive today. I mean, yes, you could. It's not absolutely awful. But some of these older DRAMless drives, the difference between them and a modern SSD, it might not be quite the leap from a hard drive to an SSD, but it is not insignificant either. So yeah, I don't actually remember what happened to this drive. I don't remember where it went, what PC it went into. I almost certainly don't have this drive anymore. All of these 240 and 480, 480 gig drives have long since been sold, or they were in machines that I sold, or I simply sold them or gave them to somebody who needed an SSD. So there will be no further reviews of this drive. But if you needed one back in the day for under $100, it was worth considering. Moving two steps up the product stack and two years further into the past, we have the SU900. This came out in 2017 and I covered it at the time and basically said it's very nice, but most of you don't need an SU900, you want an SU800. The SU800 was a really good drive for its time. This is better technically, but for the price, it wasn't worth it. 256 gigabytes for $100 back in the day. This holds sort of a, an interesting position within SSD history. It is one of the last relatively inexpensive MLC drives. Two bits per cell. It's not TLC, it's not QLC, it's actually MLC. It has a good DRAM buffer on board and it had a, for the time, a good controller. But these were relatively expensive for the amount of storage they provided and they were retired relatively quickly and just like the other MLC drives, they kind of all sort of went to the dustbin of history because price and capacity sells drives, not MLC. I used this in something back then. And by, you know, this is going to be, a, I said this in part one, this is going to be a bit of a treasure hunt for some of you. Where did this first appear in a video? Put 
a, a link or uh, you can't put a link because the links are all blocked. Put the title and the date of the video down in the video description below and note where you saw this on the channel if you remember seeing this. I don't have any idea where it ended up, although I am sure that I sold it a long time ago when it was probably way more valuable than it would be today. This drive today would probably fetch $15 at best. So it's lost almost 90% of its value in the past five or six years. If you're still using one of these today, well, whether you should upgrade or not depends deeply upon what your machine is doing. If this is serving as the boot drive in a home uh, network attached storage custom build, if it's serving as a media center boot drive, it may actually be all you need and there's no reason to replace it. If this is serving as the boot drive of your primary daily driver computer, it should probably be replaced. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. Or if it's being used in a laptop and it's just an email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter machine and watching YouTube videos, it's probably fine as well. It's probably one of the better SATA SSDs from that era, but it definitely is obsolete today. You know, as a side note, when I'm done with all this, I have to make an interesting decision. Do I keep all these boxes? They don't take up that much space, but they don't take up zero space. And you saw how many there were at the beginning of this, at the beginning of part one. In here is... That's kind of interesting. There is, oh, that's right. They used to come with these things. I've almost kind of forgotten. These are spacers. The drives uh, typically are seven millimeters thick and this is a 1.5 millimeter spacer to make them nine millimeter drives. It's got two 3M sticky things. So if you need the drive to be physically bigger to slide into a toolless tray or a laptop or some other holder that's expecting a certain thickness drive, this basically lets you artificially make it thicker. And we've got some SSD screws, which are kind of nice. I'm gonna keep those out because you know what? You always need SSD screws. And actually a relatively nice tray. This is a um, two and a half inch to three and a half inch tray. It's blue, says ADATA on it. I don't need it. I don't think I would ever use this again for like anything, but it's kind of cool. Warranty and service a white pamphlet with a bunch of writing on it in 14 languages. And otherwise, there's nothing in here. Well, that was interesting. So as I was saying, I have to make the decision what I wanna do with these. They don't take up a ton of space. I do have a lot of duplicates. I could throw out some of them. I can't imagine that we're selling their empty cardboard boxes. I mean, how much demand is there for these things? But at the same time, they actually do take up a decent amount of shelf space. And if we move, then I gotta move them. You've seen them. Do I need to show them again? Does it make the point? Would it be interesting in five years to look back at them? Maybe I'll pare the collection down to a more modest size rather than keep every single one. Like this is interesting. The last of the uh, MLC SSDs. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Moving to the middle of ADATA's product stack, not the 650, not the 900, you have the 750. Now this is a better drive than the 650, just. It is still a DRAMless drive and it has a Realtek SSD controller in it, but it came out a little bit later. This is from 2019. One terabyte, the listed retail price at the time was $120. But if memory serves, these were some of the first SSDs where one terabyte could be found for under $100 at times on sale. The thing with these is they made decent game drives. They made kind of average boot drives. If memory serves, and I am going back several years at this point, but back in 2019, you'd have paid an extra 30 or $40 as a price premium to get the same size drive in an SU-800 instead of an SU-750. I made a big SSD review video back in 2019 covering like 20 different drives. And if memory serves, you guys can correct me in the comments if I am mistaken. I said, it's worth the extra money if you can afford it, but if you're building an ultra budget machine, then sure, this will be just fine. Or at least that's probably what I should have said. In retrospect, however, the SU-800 is a much better drive and if you could at all afford it, then that would be a better choice. Or a Samsung or Crucial MX, probably 300 at the time. I don't remember, we'll have to get to the 
MX500s in a second. I don't think they came out by that point, but they were good drives as well. But the SU800s were really good. The SU750s were sort of like a spend 80% to not get 80% of the drive. If you've ever tried to run a complicated game patch on a DRAMless SSD that overshoots its SLC cache, you know the pain. Hours of updating. World of Warships patch process on a drive like this when it overshoots the SLC cache when the drive is 70 to 80% full is atrocious. My wife had the NVMe version of this drive, which we'll get to in just a minute. And I want to say it took three hours to patch World of Warships. It can be that bad. Whether you keep this sort of drive today in 2023 is kind of a personal choice, but I wouldn't. Next, we come to the SSD that everybody really should have bought back then. And interestingly enough, it actually came out in 2016. This is the SU-800. In fact, I've got three of them, 256 gigabytes, 512 gigabytes, and one terabyte. I actually don't know that the one terabyte existed back then. I'm not entirely sure. The 512 gigabyte version was $140. Prices changed a lot during those years. In fact, they're still dropping. But the 256 gig was kind of small, but you could get one for, oh, I want to say they were $69 or $79. And I don't know what the one terabyte would have been back then. But these were excellent drives. In fact, one interesting aspect of these, these are TLC, uh, NV, uh, these are TLC SATA SLC cached, that's what I meant to say, DRAM buffered SSDs. And these at the time had the largest SLC cache of any consumer level drive larger than Crucial, Samsung, and Intel at the time. What's interesting, though, is that ADATA did not disclose the size of the cache other than empty. And so it almost certainly shrank as it filled up, like many other drives do. Their SLC cache is very big when the drive's empty, and it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks as the drive gets bigger. However, I don't know that for a fact. What I do know is this. I've done several videos on these in the past. I have put them into several builds. I have used them. In fact, I still think I've got one of these. I could be wrong, but I think one of the one terabyte versions of these is in one of my test benches. I think it's one of the older test benches. You'll have to let me know. Two gold stars to whoever can find the most number of videos that cover the SU-800. These things were great back in the day. If you still have one, keep rocking it. Great SSD. Certainly the NVMe and modern drives are a lot faster, but if you've got one of these from 2016, you probably don't need to replace it if, you're, if it's still in that machine. If you've got a i7-6700, wow, that's a long time ago, an i7-6700K or an i7-7700K, even this predated Ryzen of all things. Ryzen came out March of 2017. So great drive, two thumbs up to ADATA for making a great drive and for doing something different back when the other manufacturers were struggling. One more SATA SSD from ADATA, the SU700. A weird drive and their product mix. The SU750 was DRAMless. The SU650 was DRAMless. The SU700 was not. It had a DRAM buffer. It also came out in 2017. It was more expensive, obviously, than the later 2019 drives. And then it was very quickly forgotten about. I remember nothing about this drive. 500 and, oh, excuse me, 480 gigabytes. Why some are 480 and some are 512? That's kind of frustrating, but it is what it is. The specs on this aren't great. In fact, I'm looking at them right now. In this size, 60,000 read IOPS, 80,000 write IOPS, and only 140 terabytes of total drive write life. Uh, you know, 2017, that probably wasn't terrible, but compared to modern drives, that's pretty bad. But if you have one of these, I'm sure just like the SU-800, it's fine. If it's in a machine from that era, you wouldn't need to replace it. But if you have one, don't carry it over to a new build. And that's perhaps a concept that people miss when I say, oh yeah, I wouldn't use that drive today, or I wouldn't use that today. People go, well, that's ridiculous. I use it. It's just fine. Okay. Do you use it in period-appropriate hardware? This SSD in an FX8350 is absolutely 100% fine. 
This SSD in an i5-13600K with an RTX 3070 Ti is ludicrous. So context matters. If this is installed in something five years old, rock on. But don't bring it to a new machine. A new machine means it needs a new SSD. Next up, we have a shift back to Intel NVMe SSDs. If you watched part one, and I hope you all did, you saw me cover a ridiculously large stack of the Intel 660p. These weren't perfect, but they were good enough at a good enough price at a time when premium NVMe was expensive. The predecessor to the 660p was the 600p, and these two were 600ps. How do I begin? These things were awful. They were missing the DRAM buffer that the 660p gained, although the 660p had a very small DRAM buffer and it wasn't enough, but it was good enough. But the biggest single problem is when the 660p, I should hold it this way, when the 660p ran out of SLC cache, its performance dropped to about 100 megabytes per second, which is not great, slower than some modern hard drives for sequential work, but at least it's not completely awful. The 600Ps dropped to 25 megabytes per second. <laughs> you serious? If you do a full drive write on these, the speed drops down slower than even old USB thumb drives or SD cards way slower than a hard drive. I don't want to say that a hard drive would be better because it wouldn't, but if you actually do anything substantial on these, it is atrocious. I retired these very quickly. They were absolutely awful. The reviews sometimes were mixed and you can find some old reviews that say, well, under light load, desktop load, it's not too bad. There'll be idle times for the SLC cache to clean up. These had, this is the 256 gig version, and this is the 512 gig version. Eight and not quite 16 gigabytes of SLC cache. Eight, and this was the com this is the first one I got. Eight gigs, eight gigs of cache. And the worst part is it wasn't flexible. And when it overflowed, the drive controller continued to try to write to the SLC cache while dumping the SLC cache to the NAND which is what utterly destroyed the performance. The minute you walked an inch past the SLC cache, this became absolute trash. I cannot overemphasize how much all of these things need to be put on a shelf and never put in a computer again. Did I make my point clearly enough? They were awful. These were the first generation of TLC, NAND, and the controllers were bad, the firmware was bad, it was horrible. The 660p was a big improvement, still flawed, but they fixed enough of the issues that I lived with a bunch of these for years. Most of them have been retired. I still have a couple in a couple of machines, but they were good enough. They just, oh, these are just, I cannot use the word trash hard enough. Sorry, Intel, but this effort goes to the dogs. Saving Intel's good name from that awful 600p is the 760p, a drive they did not make very long. This is a TLC 64 layer, well, how do I put this? It's everything the 600p wasn't. It has a DRAM buffer. It has an excellent SLC cache. It has excellent overrun performance. So when the SLC cache is full, it doesn't drop down to absolutely atrocious speeds. It's responsive, it's quick. It's comparable in terms, it has the same NAND that the uh, later Crucial MX500 had on it. It's not the fastest NVMe drive you can buy, not even the fastest Gen 3 NVMe drive you could buy. It was a very early drive, but its responsiveness and performance was great. I used this for a very long time. It ended up getting sold in one of the machines that I had. It was a boot drive in a machine. I sold that to somebody and it went with it because why not? But great drive, no issues using this as a boot drive. If I was building a new machine, 
I wouldn't move this to an i7-13700K today. I would get a new drive for that. But if I had a Ryzen 7 3700X or an i9-9900K and this was my boot drive, I would absolutely not change it. It is plenty for something from say 2018, 2019, maybe even 2020. If you've got a Zen 3, a Ryzen 9 5900X, this is a perfectly good boot drive or game drive or data drive, even though it's not Gen 4, it's good enough. But anything beyond 2020, you need a new drive. This is a name you have not heard of before, unless you've watched my tweets or seen a couple of our recent build videos. This is a Levin? Levin? Since 1996, it says on the box. Good for them. These are essentially no-name drives. They're sold on Amazon, they're sold on Newegg. I don't know that I would trust any ability to get warranty or service for these as far as I could throw them. They are cheap, very cheap. The last time I covered these in one of our build videos, a two terabyte drive was $99. $99 for a two terabyte drive is not bad. As I am recording this, of course it may change by the time I edit and publish this, but as I'm recording this, $86 for a two terabyte drive. $200 for a four terabyte drive. Now that's actually more than two two terabyte drives, which is weird. The four terabyte SSDs almost across the board cost more than a pair of twos, which is eternally annoying, but they're charging more because they can. $86 for a two terabyte SSD. Now these are DRAMless. They are on a cheap SMI controller. Their performance isn't bad for light use. I've used several of these. I've put these actually into machines. How do I put this? The minute you use these heavily, they will turn into hot trash. There's no DRAM buffer. The design is not intended for heavy use. But if you're looking for a game drive, not a boot drive, don't use this as a boot drive in anything. But if you're looking for a game drive and money is tight, Heck, you could buy the one terabyte version. The one terabyte version of these things is $43. It's almost a door prize. You shouldn't buy one, but the 256 and 512 gig versions, yes, they make them, I don't know why, are like 15 and 20 bucks respectively. That's insane. So yeah, it's, it's cheap, but I own several of them. I've used several of them. I don't like DRAMless drives. I don't like cheap no-name drives, but for the price, it's compelling for extra storage. I covered a bunch of 888 SATA SSDs earlier. I now have a very large stack of 888 NVMe drives to cover, and this is gonna kinda be all over the place. This is an SX8200, not an SX8200 Pro. It's an important distinction. I have exactly one of these drives. These are all 8200 Pros. Long story, I'll get to that in a minute. This is from 2018. It is performance competitive with the Samsung 970 Evo, mostly. It's not quite there. There's a few deficiencies, corner cases, sustained write performance, and a few other things that makes it not quite as fast. It was a third cheaper. 480 gigabytes for, at the time, $159. Now in 2018, TLC, not QLC, at NVMe SSD with an SLC cache and a DRAM buffer and a reasonably good levels of performance for $159, that was actually considered normal back at the time. You could, for about $230 to $240, buy this in a Samsung 970 Evo, not the Evo Plus that came later. It's a compromise. Samsung's software is better. Samsung's name and reputation are better. But I will tell you, I've used a lot of A data drives and machines over the years. And by and large, with a couple of exceptions, they've been great. I have actually had a couple of A data drives go bad on me. With the exception of OCC drives from 15, OCZ drives from 15 years ago, think Apex Vertex 30 gig drives from 2008, these have really kind of been the only SSDs that have died on me. 
and not the A200, A200 Pro. I've had some others. It's A Data's quality control is kind of all over the place. I recommended A Data back in 2018 and 2019 pretty hard for the 30% price savings and the near peer levels of performance. And if you bought an SX8200 or 8200 Pro, you probably had great performance. We'll talk about these in a minute. They don't all have the same control or the same performance. That's that's a separate conversation. But this was interesting. Now, would I use one today? I don't know that I would. I would maybe if it was still on an old machine and it was running fine. Definitely don't move these to anything new and modern. I question the long-term reliability of some of the early A-data drives from that era just because of some of the issues I've run into. And there's been a question as to whether all their drives are really made the same because they've changed a lot of parts, NAND controllers, which we'll talk about in a second. So I would, if you've got a five-year-old A-data drive, I would be inclined to replace it just because of those concerns. But that's me. Before we talk about some of the other NVMe drives from A-Data, we need to talk about the SX8200 Pro. This is both one of the best NVMe SSDs that I have ever reviewed and one of the worst. Here's the good. Premium NVMe, TLC, SLC cached, DRAM buffered, great controller, great performance, about as good as it gets. Think Samsung 970 Evo Plus. Great, amazing, fast drives. If you buy the launch versions, there have been at least three different versions of these drives made, and I suspect there have been more. Now, I have a page of the specs up here to talk about them because the drives that were sent out as reviews, and here's an interesting point. If you look, I've got a barcode on this drive. I have a scratched out barcode on this one because some of these were product samples from Adata. Now, I had the idea back then, I have enough of them. These are all SX8200 Pros. I had the idea back then to actually stick all of these in a machine, record the type of NAND flash chips on them, record the controller, the firmware versions, test them for performance, and do a big comparison to figure out exactly what's going on. Here's the problem. That takes time, and the number of people who care is truly this big. If, if it affects you, you care. If you feel cheated or ripped off, you care. I don't know that most people care. I could be wrong. The launch drives are some of the fastest Gen 3 TLC NAND SSDs ever made until you go to the Gen 4 stuff. The latest drives are not. The original drives had SM2262EN controllers using Micron 96 layer 512 gigabit dies. Forgive me, I have to read that in small print. The latest drives use SK Hynix and they use a different type of TLC NAND, which is noticeably slower. I have seen other reviews that indicate that the more recent drives made two years after these first launched are up to one gigabyte slower in terms of overall write speed. They also switched to the SM2263G controller, which is not as fast as the EN controller. Now, does it technically still meet the specs on the box? A data says it does. I understand the need to update products over the years. However, if you're going to update products, new products should generally have a new product name. Maybe it should be the SX8200 Pro 2 or SX8200 10 Pro. For marketing reasons, I get that that creates marketing expenses and marketing challenges. But if you're going to release a drive that uses NAND that is a gigabyte slower than the launch drive that all the reviewers had, and you don't provide any way to tell based upon the box. You go onto Newegg, you go onto Amazon, you place your order, and you don't know what you're going to get. There was a lot of controversy at the time. And when the controversy first came out, they changed the controller, but they didn't change the NAND. And the performance was a bit slower, but not by enough to matter. And I actually said at the time, I said, well, 
It might be 5 or 10% slower, but these things are so good. The prices have come down. Uh, that's not the end of the world. But then they did the second revision. And for all I know, well, that second, third revision. For all I know, they did a fourth revision. But by that point, we'd all moved on. And well, I never got back around to it. So for that, I apologize. I don't actually have all, for those of you curious, no, I don't actually have all these anymore. Some have been sold. Some are machines that I sold. I've done a lot of builds on the channel. I've upgraded a lot of machines. I've, so most of these have gone away at this point. I've got two or three left. I, I don't, and I don't know which they are. Are they the early drives or are they the later drives? I could probably match up serial numbers and go to all that trouble. Water under the bridge. It's 2023. I will say the same thing about these that I will say about the SX8200 non-pro. If you have it in an existing machine and you're using it, fine. Carry on. They're great, amazing drives. Even the slower ones are still pretty good. I would not move them to new machines. If you build a new computer, retire it. Sell it, move on from it. I mean, you can keep it as a game drive or a data drive if you really want to. But given the history of these things and given the uncertainty of ADA's process on them, I know I, for one, when I pull them out of machines, I'm retiring them because I just, I don't want anything to do with the controversy or the unknowns. They didn't, for example, here's one. The three different revisions I'm looking at here use three different kinds of NAND. The first one uses Micron, the second one uses Samsung, and the third one uses SK Hynix. But the terabyte write life drive ratings, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, are the same for all the drives. They never updated the specs. You cannot tell me that all of those NAND have exactly the same endurance. I mean, you could, but I wouldn't believe you. Now, it's possible that they are all above the specifications published by ADATA, which, okay, if they'll meet the published specs, then I guess you shouldn't complain. Maybe. It just bothers me. Does it bother you? Let me know in the comments below if you own one of these. Let me know if you own one, did you know about the controller changes? I'm curious to see what you guys think about this one. Next up, we have the SX6000 and 6000 Pro and 6000 Lite. ADATA did some very confusing product naming. Now, this box is not actually for the SX6000 Lite. However, I had a one terabyte SX6000 Lite, which I cannot find the retail box for. Now that drive was a product sample from ADATA. A drive sent to me from the manufacturer is usually going to be a decent drive. That is one of the very few SSDs in my 15 year history of using SSDs that absolutely outright failed on me. It was also the SSD that was in my wife's computer that took three hours to update World of Warships, although that was a few years ago. The performance on those things is atrocious. No DRAM buffer and no ability to handle overriding its SLC cache worth two hoots. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the specifications of the SX6000, it's better and worse. The SX6000, not Pro, has a DRAM buffer. So claims eight in it. Several of the product pages claim DRAM buffers that don't have them. The SU750's product page claims a DRAM buffer and it doesn't have one. So this claims to have a DRAM buffer, but it is a PCI Express Gen 3 X2 drive, one gigabyte per second max, 800 megabyte per second uh, write speed, one gigabyte per second read speed for a Gen 3 two-lane drive. So it's only running at half the speed of the two lanes. Why even have a two-lane drive? Why not make it a four-lane drive? Are you somehow saving money on producing the drive by making it a two-lane drive? Maybe. The rest of the specs are awful. The IOPS, the uh, random performance is atrocious. These frankly were awful. Now the SX, I'm just gonna include it here, the SX6000 Pro had better specifications. Sure, I still wouldn't trust it as far as I could throw it. In my experience, the entire 6000 line was pretty awful and really should just be tossed in the bin. 
I pulled them all from everything that they were in. I had several different drives in several different configurations. I got rid of them all because this was a very disappointing showing from Adata. Next, we have an Adata drive from their XPG gaming brand. Hey, if you put a red heatsink on it and call it gaming, it must be faster. The specs on these drives are really good. TLC, SLC cache, DRAM buffered, eight channel controller. Sweet! What if I told you that this premium SSD NVMe 3.5 gigabytes per second advertised read speed was half the performance of a Samsung 860 Evo SATA SSD. It is. These things are slow. Why? That's an interesting question. Small SLC cache. The eight channel controller is running in six channel mode. It has a non-standard 384 bit NVMe die. And Adata struggled to get drives really good back then. These things are awful. This has fewer IOPS than a Samsung SATA SSD, and it is a NVMe drive advertised with premium features. If you still have one of these, congratulations. You have a drive that sounds great, but isn't. I'm sure it's fine for a lot of people and many people wouldn't notice the difference. Uh, I don't have these anymore. These have long since been replaced, sent away, sold. I have no idea. I haven't had these for a while. I used to love Adata so much but they made too many drives and they made drives like this that don't live up to their product specifications. Next, we have the model one notch down from the SX8200 Pro, the SX8100. Very similar performance to the SX8200 Pro with some compromises. It's a little bit slower and it has less DRAM. That is not a concept, I'll be honest, that I was completely aware of back in the day. The fact that some drives had more DRAM on them than others is sort of, in retrospect, you look back and go, that explains that. The 660p from Intel had a quarter to an eighth of the DRAM it really needed. So it was good, but it wasn't great. The SX8200 Pro has basically what is considered to be the gold standard, similar to the 970 Evo one gigabyte of DRAM for each terabyte of storage. If you have a 512 gig drive, you should have 512 megabytes of DRAM. If you have a two terabyte SSD, you should have two gigabytes of DRAM. The DRAM should scale up one gigabyte per terabyte to store the whole drive map and state information into local DRAM on the drive. The SX8100 splits the difference between super budget and super premium. The two terabyte drives, for example, have one gigabyte of DRAM on board, half of what the 8200 Pro does. This saves on production costs. The drive was also made in four terabyte capacities, which you can currently see here on the desk, which the 8200 Pro was not. Four terabytes in a single drive is handy. Two terabytes is nice. One terabyte at the time was good enough for a lot of people, but four terabytes is definitely nice. These are good game drives they are good secondary drives. They are good tertiary drives. They're okay boot drives. For budget builds, if you'd bought one of these back in 2000 for a Ryzen 5 3600 or a Ryzen 5 5600X, if you'd bought one of these for an i5 10400, you know what? Sure, for a boot drive, it's fine. Don't move it to a new build. If you're building an i9-13900K today and this used to be on your i7 10700K, please, dear God, Lord, do not take it with you as a boot drive. You could potentially take it with you as a secondary drive, but my caveats to Adata and XPG by extension follow over from the other drives. These are all SX8100s. I have no assurance that these are all the same drive, despite the labels. It left a sour taste in my mouth. So I've been replacing these over time. Although I do actually have one of these in my own personal gaming machine. It works fine. 
you know, the machine's on all the time. Games update overnight. I don't notice it. It's fine. Nice drives, but use caution in how long you continue to use them given the history. Next, we have the XPG S40G. Yes, that's an interesting term. As you can see here, it is RGB. These are fun. It's basically an SX8200 Pro with RGB slapped onto the top of it. Again, the same caveats of the SX8200 Pros. What controller, what NAND, what speed, I don't know. I do know that I have a four gigabyte version of this and it works fine, so I can't complain. But, and it's a shame because the RGB is really good looking. I, it, if you like RGB and not everybody does, it is really, really pretty. And actually I've, I've got, well, I've got the boxes for three of them. Two of them have been sold, but I do have the four gigabyte version. And it's like, wow, it's really, really good price. At the time I bought it, it was $400 for four terabytes, which was a killer deal at the time. Now they're cheaper and they've been cheaper since, but at the time I bought it, that was just RGB and a premium TLC NVMe uh, DRAM buffered performance drive for 400 bucks for four terabytes. That was a steal. I might keep it. I don't know. I might use it as a tertiary drive. I might use it as like a backup reserve game drive for the games that I don't play as often. We'll see. It's such a pretty drive. There aren't enough RGB NVMe SSDs. Probably because now you have the full plate covers on motherboards as you can't really see them the way you used to be able to. But it's a fun drive if you've got room for it. Looking for a Windows 10 or 11 product key, but you don't want to spend $100 to $200 for it? Our sponsor, URCD Keys, provides discounted Windows keys at amazing prices. $15 for Windows 10 Professional, $21 for Windows 11 Professional, and just $60 for Microsoft Office 2021 Professional Plus. These product keys are the real deal. They activate directly with Microsoft Online, link to your Microsoft account, and they work forever. For Windows, you simply go to Settings, Update and Security, Activation, click Change Product Key, paste the key provided by URCD Keys, and in seconds, you're activated with Microsoft. For Office, go to setup.office.com, sign in with your Microsoft account, paste the product key provided by URCD Keys, and then download Office 2021 Pro Plus directly from Microsoft. Remember to use the discount code TD20 to save 25% off the already deeply discounted prices and support our channel at the same time. We have been using product keys from URCD Keys for almost five years now without any issues and encourage you to do so as well. In front of me, I now have the Sabrent Rocket 4 Gen 4 Premium NVMe Drive. Premium first gen NVMe Drive. And I'm gonna tell you all about it in part three of this video series. This was just meant to be something quick, easy, and fun to film. I started filming this after part two of the i5-13600K build. I thought, I have all these SSD boxes. I'll just do a quick history of SSDs on the ch this is me here. I don't do anything quick. The reason I'm turning this into part three is I looked at how long I've been recording and I look at the pile still sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be excessively long. So I did not film an outro to part one, although maybe I'll go back and film one, but I am filming a proper outro to this one and then I will see you all again in part three. If you would like to see all three parts early, you can join on YouTube or Floatplane. Link down in the video description below or just hit the join button right next to the subscribe button and then you can see them all early. We will edit all three at the same time and then post them over time. So there'll be links to all three down in the video description below, but they will be released sequentially and so members can view them all at once if you want. $2 a month or $20 a year, your support is greatly appreciated. Like, comment, subscribe, and do all of the YouTube things. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see all of you next time.